So I'm talking to you about vision once again. Seeing God's vision of the church. Seeing God's vision of the church. Okay? So I've got these cards once again. Beautiful. Somebody says, I don't know. Okay? This one's blank. I'm fine with that. Like I said, it's easier to write on a blank piece of paper than to have to erase something that's already there. All right? I've got one that says to make disciples of men, to worship the Lord and uh, proclaim the gospel. This one says to be in unity. This one says to promote the kingdom of God. This one says to bring others to Christ in a relationship with him, to bring people to Jesus Christ. The vision of this church is to know what God wants. Beautiful. Uh, this one is a long one. Wow. This one's got points to it. One, two, and three. Wonderful. To come together one accord and preach the gospel to the lost. I'll leave the rest of that. This one says a house of prayer. This one says the vision of this church is knowing what God wants and forming ourselves around it. Somebody took notes last week. Glory to God. I know when I, know when I made a statement and somebody <laughs> repeated it, okay? I'm not trying to form cookie-cutter Christianity here, but we've all got to be on the same page. Thank you. Growing discipleships, for, disciples for God. This one says to pray and to hope. Okay, so let's move forward. Thank you for your answers on that. You know, and, and what I want to see here, and I've already seen change since last week. I'm already starting to see some of the things coming forward is over the next course of weeks as we go into this that our, our answers to this are going to evolve, and that's fine. That's what we want. We want to see change to what we are seeing, okay? Now, something that, that I've got to communicate to you in this is... We must have a vision because the Bible says, Proverbs 29 and 18 says that without or where there is no vision, people perish. So I'm moving into this today and this is going to be segment two to this and what I'm talking about here is going to be obtaining clear perception and avoiding visual obstructions. So I don't expect every person in here to have a perfect picture of what we are doing here because at this point there is an incomplete picture. If I began painting a picture before you and tried to get you to start guessing what I'm painting, you may have an incomplete answer because we don't see this all together yet. So I'm not asking you to uh, guess here, but I am asking, what I'm asking you for is what is already on the inside of you, okay? I'm not saying that anything that you answered here was right or wrong. I want to see what is already in you, okay? Part of discipleship and part of making a disciple is also finding out what is in the disciple. Everybody with me? Okay, so let's move forward here. And I just went through this of what is the vision of this church. Now, one thing I want to establish with you about that is that we all have to share the same vision, you know, then the reason that I'm saying this is because I believe first and foremost is that God puts us together and he puts us together for a work and he puts us together to work a common work. Not that what we're doing is common. It's actually going to become uncommon because the gospel is not commonplace in our world and we are to make the gospel known to men. So as God puts us together, we all have to collaborate and come together in what is it that God wants here. Because when God begins to put people together, we have to understand what he is wanting out of this. God has something he wants in this. And, it, and it's not just for, God's not a selfish God. This is not all about you know, what he wants. He wants us also to have an enjoyment in this. You know, God puts a man and woman together and God, because God wants offspring, but God also puts them together for their enjoyment. The Bible says that God gives us all things richly for what? Enjoy. Our enjoyment. So God wants us to enjoy this together. You know, it's one of the worst things to be uh, with a group of believers and not in, a, enjoy the experience.
That's a troubled place. That's a, 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 to me, that's a church that's in trouble. When the people coming together are not enjoying their experience together. So this is what we have to move towards. And I want, you know, I want to be part of something that's bigger than me. Glory to God. You know, yesterday I was given the opportunity to go and serve in another community, and I enjoyed it. I worked hard, but I enjoyed it. I enjoy serving something bigger than me, something that, something that, that I know that God is involved in. And sometimes those, the task, you know, ministry is work. And, and being a Christian, there is ministry for every believer to be involved in. And that ministry, many times, does not look like what we think it's going to look like. So, with all of that said, I'll begin with this. We must hold the vision or we become subject to spiritual negation. Stay with me on this as I begin to open up the scripture. So, I'm going to be finding the book of Isaiah, first of all. Now, I've got... So many notes, folks, that there's no way that I can get through all of this in one day, so I'm going to give this in an abridged form, all right? I'm going to try my best to be short in this. So I want you to find Isaiah chapter 22, Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah is a wonderful book to study, of, to study vision from. We must hold the vision or we will become subject to spiritual negation. What do I mean? We become ineffective. And I'm talking to you about ab avoiding visual obstructions, and I'm talking to you also about obtaining a clear perspective. So anything that seems fuzzy here, out of focus, if we're not all seeing the same thing together, then we've got to begin to have an a open dialogue about this and communicate and come together. The body of Christ, I believe, is, it is so separated right now, and this is an obstruction to us. In the midst of a society that is spiraling into turmoil and division, this has to become the challenge of Christianity to begin to come together against every type of segregation over we have to overcome the obstacles of racism we have to be, we have to overcome uh, the obstacles within class warfare that's happening within our nation we have been called to come together whether we're Jews Greeks Romans whatever it doesn't matter to our nationality it doesn't matter whether we're bond or free. It doesn't matter whether we're rich or we're poor. We are to come together as the body of Christ and the household of faith into the unity of the faith and a, a unity of spirit. So there is a vision, first of all, that I'm communicating to you, and I saw this on some of your cards, that we do have to have a unity of vision. And the reason that I'm saying this is Jesus had said that if your eye is single, then your body can be full of light. We do have to have a singleness of eye. Now, that doesn't mean that we have singleness of vision because God did give us two eyes, but those two eyes do see and look at one thing. But I want to communicate something more to you here that I believe that vision cannot be held by just one identification. You know, I can look at a cube, if I were to imagine in my mind a cube, an ice cube here, I could look at one flat surface and say that is my vision. Or that thing can be turned and I, or I can begin to look around it and see that it is multifaceted. So I want you to see that, that when we begin to talk about a vision that God gives to the church and gives to us together as a church, and there is a, a broader vision that is of the whole church, but we're not talking about that at this moment. The whole church of Jesus Christ has a vision. God has a vision. He said that he's going to build his church and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. God, Jesus has something in vision of what his church is going to be and become in the world and that's what he envisions. Now we want to see the broader scope of that because we are part of that broader body. But I believe that God gives an individual churches within a community, he gives them a, 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 a certain singleness of vision because they have a collective work to do together and they are to work together with other bodies within that community so i don't want to become subject to spiritual negation or whether we become just irrelevant in society
I'm looking at here, I'm going to be opening up to Isaiah 22. Let me get over there myself, okay? How many of you love the book of Isaiah? It's a big book with a lot of chapters, but it's a wonderful book. You need to be reading your Bible. You need to be reading your Bible at home. You need to be studying the Word of God. I'm encouraging you to do so. So, I'm going to talk to you some today about open vision and about even blind spots. So let's look here at Isaiah chapter 22. I want to look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, The burden of the valley of vision. What ails you now? That you are wholly gone up to the housetops. He goes on and says that you are full of stirs. Now I'm reading from the King James. A tumultuous city, a joyous city. Your slain men are not slain with the sword nor dead in battle. All your rulers are fled together. They are bound by the archers. All that are found in you are bound together, which have fled from far. Therefore said I, look away from me. I will weep bitterly. Labor not to comfort me, because the spoiling of the daughter of my people. Pay attention to verse 5. He says, for it is a day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and the crying to the mountains. Let's pray. Father, what you want communicated, I do not want to say any more than what you want said. Neither do I want to enter into a place, Lord, where I say anything less. I cannot add to your word other than what it already says. But I know that through the scripture there is a communication of the gospel that you make your word known through the preaching of the gospel. This is totally about the gospel of Jesus Christ. What I feel that you have zeroed in on my heart is to bring this body together in one accord and to one have one mind and one heart and one spirit. Now I know that God, this can seem like a daunting task in this world. But all things are possible to him that believes. And I have clear examples through the scripture. Lord, how that this has been accomplished before. That the body of Christ, Lord, has been in places where it put away strikes. It put away divisions. It put away things that separated one from another. And Lord, there are multitudes of different personalities multitudes of different backgrounds in this room. But you can melt our hearts together by the Spirit of God. And Lord, that which you have formed in us and that which you have forged inside of us, that God, you bring us together to have and share the same mind. My Lord and my God, when I think about sharing the same mind with other believers. I think about how even in the world, when men began to build the Tower of Babel, that nothing became impossible to them. And you even recognize that. But Lord, how much more when you bring together those of like faith, God, what becomes, Lord, seemed a daunting task before can become very easy. I believe that you intended for us to be able to preach the gospel and dwell together, Lord, with ease, with favor, with one another. I thank you for that. That strife and divisions fall. Lord, if there are even thoughts one toward another in this place, that they just begin to melt away into something greater
ourselves. I thank you that when we come together that we will have the same heart and same mind and forge within us the same spirit towards you. I praise you, holy and heavenly Father, for all of these things. And I know that you hear my prayer because I pray this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, just real quick, I talked to you about having unity of vision and oneness of heart, oneness of mind, and oneness of hope. Now, I came to you from the scripture in Ephesians 4 and 13, talking to you once again about the unity of the faith. So I'm moving on today from that, and I want you to look real quick, hold your place in Isaiah, because I'm coming back to Isaiah. I want you to look over in 1 Samuel chapter 3. If you've got something that you can mark your page in Isaiah 22, just mark your page, hold your place there. Because we're going to come back there. And we're going to look at some other places in Isaiah as well. I need to stop and explain what vision is. Just for a moment. I'm not saying that you don't know. I just want to cover this base. Okay? So I'm looking at 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 1. How many of you want to see greater than yourself? If you are a believer and a follower of Jesus, the Bible says that if we are going to follow him, that we have to take up a cross and deny ourselves. For me to deny myself, I've got to see something greater than myself. The Bible tells me to look unto Jesus who is the author and finisher of my faith. My eyes are to be fixed on him. I am to set my affections on that which is above. In the midst of that setting of affections, I believe that God begins to distribute to his body and they begin to hear callings to different positions, places, and missions in which God has designed for us. You know, God did intend for you to be a worshiper, but God did not intend for you to spend 24 hours a day yet worshiping him because there is still a work to be done in this community. We have been called to preach the gospel to all, to preach the gospel to unbelievers, to preach the gospel wherever we are, whether we are in Lancaster or whether we are in Jerusalem, we are to preach the gospel. So, I want to look at, just for a one moment, I want to capture a moment in time here from the scripture when the children of Israel have become settled into the land in which they are, have possessed now. So they've moved into the land of Israel, they've set up homes, they've set up shop, they've set up their farms, they've set up everything, and they've set up a place to worship the Lord. Now it happens here that it says in verse 3, you know, not everything was perfect, but going forward here it says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the Lord, and excuse me, look at it with me, And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. Stop. They have everything they need. But somehow, they've reached a place now where the word of God has become rare to them. Sometimes we can become comfortable in where we're at and what we're doing. And I believe a proper design around us as believers is we have to have people around us that will challenge us and keep us from, from becoming apathetic and becoming comfortable by just sitting we need to be challenged. You know, when I became a believer, I was challenged to do things that I had never done before. I had Pastor Les in my life challenging me. He would, we'd drive to Walmart. He'd say, Todd, we're going to get out of the van and we're just going to start walking up to people, strangers, and talking to them about Jesus. Now I'm thinking, I've never done anything like this in my life. I don't just walk up to people and start talking, making a conversation with them. This was...
natural to me. I was very hesitant to do this. Now I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know what to say. I, I wanted to tell him, give me a line. You know, He just said, we're getting out, and I'm going that way, and you're going that way. We're going to be in the same parking lot. I was terrified. Well, what do I say? You know, a whole lot of Christian people sometimes, they say, well, I, I don't know how to lead somebody to the Lord. Have you ever tried? If you've never tried, then you won't ever know how to. You've got to, at some place, you've got to be put in the circumstance and in the situation, you know, and nobody's expecting you to, to do something perfectly. We are learners. We are disciples. You know, we, many times we learn as we go. Experience can be a great teacher. Wisdom can be as well. So, you know, my first experience, the first guy I ever walked up to, I said, excuse me, sir, can I talk to you about Jesus? And he just looked at me and he stuck his hand in my face, like, in my face, and just walked on and I was like, well, he didn't punch me, he didn't hit me, and he didn't spit on me. So, but he didn't want to talk to me. So I just said, oh, well. There was another lady coming out and I said, excuse me, ma'am, can I talk to you about Jesus? And she was some, in some other kind of religion. I don't know if you remember this, Les. And Les came up and we started talking to her. I don't remember if they were Jehovah Witnesses or what. But I began to understand, you have to engage people with the gospel. You can't just stand back and wait for something to happen. We are people who make things happen. You know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, I don't feel like I was led to do that or I wasn't sent there. Well, you know, sometimes Jesus, he just said, you go. Sometimes people are sent and sometimes people just went. And I've found that in either case, God was there with me because many times God sent me to my neighbor's house. He said, Todd, I want you to go over to your neighbor's house. And most of the times when God sent me somewhere, I didn't want to go. But there's been other times that I just said, Hey, I called you know, a brother on the phone. Hey, Philip, let's go here. Let's go to this community. And as we went, the Lord went with us. You know, when you intend to do a thing, God will come alongside of you and show out for you that I don't know why we think that God's got to appear to us in our bedroom and say, you know, Todd, I want you to go down on Brooklyn Street and I want you to meet up with this, this guy named Daryl and I want you to talk. The disciples didn't do that. Jesus sent them out. And many times you're like Abraham. You don't know where you're going. You just go in faith. I used to know a, an older brother in the Lord. He's gone from us now. But he would get in his car and he would begin to drive around town expecting, you know who I'm talking about? Brother Hazel, he would drive around town expecting that wherever he went that God was going to show up. I mean, he would drive into the parking lot. I remember him telling me he drove into a parking place and looked up and he saw a man sitting in a car and he said, the Spirit of God said, go over and talk to him. That man got healed from cancer, did he not? In the parking lot in Lancaster Square. You know, many times we just go not knowing. Now, the children of Israel have reached a place where they are, they're not hearing God. The word of the Lord has become precious in those days. Read on with me in verse 3. He says, there was no open vision. There was no open vision. Some of you Bibles, if you've got a different translation, it may say there was no redemptive revelation. Does anybody say something different? Wave at me if it does. There was no open vision. Okay, so obviously they have come into a place where spiritual vision has become obstructed. And we have to avoid that. I notice here that when this chapter starts out, it starts out with a child. And we're going to begin to see that God is going to begin to speak to a child. You know, many times the scripture fulfills itself in this way that God says a little child shall lead them. Here we have the high priest of God and we have a little child that does not even know the Lord yet. 
who God is going to begin to speak to and correct the problem in the nation. The spiritual leader of the nation is not hearing from God. Well, actually, if you find out as you're reading this later, he is hearing from God, but he does not want to do what God says to do because he says that your sons are wicked and you will not correct them. And they are stealing the sacrifices from my house. And they are corrupting the nation. You know, even when the word of judgment comes to Eli through Samuel, he just says, well, let the Lord do what he will. There was no repentance. There was no, you know, I'm going to change this. I'm going to confront this situation. So going on here, I want to look at this word where it says open vision real quick. Is that what your Bible says? There was no open vision. So the word here that appears you know, we don't have to be Hebrew scholars or anything, but I'm giving you my references here. I pulled this off of blueletterbible.com. If you want to go check it, you can for yourself. It is an online Bible that will give you Greek and Hebrew, and you can read from the original text that the Bible was written in. This word that appears here is the word kazon for vision. This is what's listed on that website, that vision can be something that happens in an ecstatic state. This is why many times when I've tried to define this word to people, I will tell you that most of the time when people obtain a vision, they either obtain this in a place of prayer, a place of worship, or a place of praise. Because people began to, they, when they begin to escalate or go into a state where they forget about themselves, that's what praise, praise is such a wonderful thing because you forget about yourself and you begin to think about God. You know, I believe it's one of the greatest escapes for depression or oppression, heaviness in life, being overburdened or cares. You know, it's just a wonderful place to go. This is a place where your heart and your spirit begins to open up to be able to see. So this tells me something about the children of Israel. That in that day there was no open vision and I believe it's because there was no one really visiting the courts of the Lord. Even though they were in the house of God, they were not worshiping God. There was, and I can point to this because when if you were to back up Eli, when he sees Samuel's mother praying, he thinks that she's drunk. He doesn't even understand the state in which she is at. She is in a place, she is in that place place where she has arrived into a place of prayer and when he looks at her he doesn't understand it you know the bible says that people will think that you are drunk even those who were at the day of pentecost in the upper room the bible says that when it, they saw them they were gathered all together in one place and in one accord and what were they doing they were all praying together and the spirit of god fell on them and those who looked upon them thought that they were drunk because they had come into a state of, of I call it, a, a state in which they can receive. Okay? Second here, a vision can come to you in the night. Third, a vision is an oracle, a prophecy, or a divine communication. Now this in itself, I have to stop and say, I believe that God is communicating with believers. And I believe that God is communicating with unbelievers. You know why I can say that? Because God spoke to Adam while he was yet in sin. He was in the garden in sin and God said, where are you? And Adam would have never known where he was at except God would have spoken to him. I know by my own experience that God had to speak to my heart. No man's words were going to change what I believed or thought. It had to be God. And you know what? There's many times that you're going to go out here and preach the gospel and they're not going to listen. But you know what you're going to do? You're going to go and pray for them. And you know what's going to happen? God's going to speak to them. And you know what? They can run from you. They can run from what you say. But they cannot run from God. David understood this when he said, I can make my bed in hell and yet you are there. You can't run from God. And there's people People out here that are running from God, but they cannot run from him. They can get in a rocket ship and go to Mars, but God is there. So they can run from you. They cannot answer your cell phone. You can text them gospel scriptures and they not, they not message you back. They may curse you and say, I wish they'd stop all that. You may not even know that they feel that. 
One day you will. Whether it's they say it or one day they come and say, you know, I really did not like you. You know, there are people that don't like y'all. Y'all might as well go ahead and accept this. If you are a believer in Christ, the world is not going to just receive you readily. Jesus said, if they hated me, what do you think they're going to do to you? I've had people hate me just because I was a believer. I'm okay with that. You know why? Because their feelings are subject to change. Because I've got a God that's bigger than me and them. And when he starts talking to them and their heart, they begin to view me through different eyes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They are subject to change. Thank you, Father. I love that. Fourthly, a vision can be a title to a book of prophecy. Finally, it says that this is something that we see mentally, but yet this came from a dream, a revelation, an oracle. It is a vision. Further, I'm going to add to this my definition. It is to perceive something from the spirit and begin to see it together or to see it mentally. So this is something that has to be for us together. When God puts us together, we have to begin to move into a place where we perceive by the Spirit why we are here together. Now, many times this comes together with leadership. This comes together with uh, the prophets have to begin to prophesy, and we have to begin to come into an align with it. So going back to what I earlier said is that we have to hold a vision we have to hold it. We cannot let it just slip away. We cannot just hear it and it go away. We can't be hearers of a vision and just, just hear it. We have to become vi doers, just like God's Word. We can hear it and never do it. The same can happen with a vision because a vision is divine communication from God. What is it that God is communicating to us? What is it? And I'm talking about something bigger than just what you hear me preaching to you. Why does God have you here? Let me tell you, first of all, God did not bring you here for you to sit here for 40 years and listen to me preach. Aren't you glad? Please give a hand clap. Thank God. Hallelujah. God did not bring you here to listen to me for 40 years and then me preach your funeral as you go to heaven. God has something bigger than that. And that's how you become a spiritual in a place of spiritual negation where you are not doing what God intended. That is very possible for us to not do the will of God. So we need to perceive from the Spirit. What is it? And this is what I'm asking you. I'm asking you why, why? Why does God have you here? That's not a wrong question to ask. It's not wrong to ask questions. Do you know that God asks questions? If you did a study through the scripture and looked at how many times that God asked a question, did you know that God asked a question that he already knows the answer to? Sometimes you are being asked a question that God already knows the answer. He already knows the answers. Why would he ask you a question? When he said to Adam, where are you? Was it that God was looking behind this bush? Are you over there? No, he knows exactly where Adam is. He asked the question so that you will know where you are. You have to know where you are or you don't know anything. You're just lost. We don't want to be a body of believers who are lost in what we are here for. We are here for a work. And we don't want to become lost in that work nor distracted in while we're in the midst of it. So I've got to say this, looking back at Isaiah. Let's look at Isaiah again, chapter 22. Isaiah 22. Vision... And these are my notes from this because he's talking about a burden in a valley of vision. Look at it with verse 22, verse 1. Excuse me, chapter 22, verse 1. So visions come with valleys and burdens. There's valleys in a vision. There's burdens that come with a vision. Do we believe that when God gives us a vision together that there's not going to be obstructions against it. I can clearly say from the Apostle Paul in his writings that he had a vision for the gospel of Jesus Christ and its progression and to make disciples of all men in the world, but he yet said Satan hindered 
Actually, he said Satan hindered us. He wasn't doing what he was doing alone. He was with a whole team and company of people. And he was not just out on his own. He was sent out from the church of Antioch and he returned to that church. And that is a church that held a vision to reach the gospel, to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It does not take many, folks. I had the pleasure yesterday, and this may have been one of the reasons that I was there where I was at yesterday. Philip had was uh, Philip and Elijah were there. They had we were had ate lunch together, and they went back, and I got talking with one of the other pastors there. He was an older man in the Lord. He told me he was 68 years old. He said he had pastored one church for 22 years. He pastored some other churches. He said, but he said, but I got distracted from what God called me to do. He said, God called me to make disciples. He said, I sat down and I did the simple math one day. He said, if 22 years ago, I would have discipled one person a year, just one, that would be 22 people, one a year. But if I would have discipled them properly, each one of those people, when they're dis if I would have discipled them for a year, when that person in the next year, if they just discipled one person. Do you all follow what I'm saying now? If each one of those 22 people would have discipled one person, then we would have had, we have to begin to do the math. So he said, I sat down and I wrote down 22 to the 22nd power. And what came to me was a number over 4 million people. A lot of times we don't see that in the small, there's something greater. If you and I come together in that same mind of what he is talking about and begin to, if you hold on to that vision, do you see how far the possibilities begin to go? It's limitless with God. You, by discipling one person a year within 22 years, can reach four, over 4 million people. That is greater than the number of people that live in the state of South Carolina. Just by that simple process, 12 months, to spend 12 months discipling one person. When that process, moving to disciple somebody else. But that person has to begin to disciple somebody. Okay? Linda, you and I have talked about that from uh, the movie. What was the movie again? War Room. That's a, a lot of the principle base in that is this person, I disciple this person, but I disciple this person. You know, there's a whole old saying, I don't know where this came from, but I was thinking about it yesterday and even when I went to bed last night. If each one will reach one and teach one, if each one of you will reach one, just one person, think about that. Can we reach, can you reach one person this year? In 2017, if this becomes your goal, I ain't talking about some New Year resolution, but just to reach one person and disciple that person, what, what kind of impact can we, if I can impact over the next 20 years, 4 million people start doing the math. This is the type of mind that the early church had. That's why even the leaders of the world at that time said they have turned the world upside down. Four million, eight million, 12 million, 16 million, 20 million, 24, 28, 32, keep going. 36, 40, 44, 48, 52, 56, 60, 64, 68, 72, 76 million people in 20 years. Folks, that is what is called a revival. That is what's called a revival. Revivals don't happen on a Wednesday to Friday. And people just get excited about the Lord and then the next year, I mean the next week, it's all over with. That's not a revival. The Great Awakening happened over a span of about 20 years where you had millions of people come 
and they come to the Lord because people get a vision to reach one person. And that's all, you can reach one at a time. I learned that when I used to do, uh, when I was doing street ministry with Tommy Littleton in Myrtle Beach, he said, watch, Todd, we're going to walk into a crowd of people. And he said, there might be 10 people. And he said, by the time I get finished talking, the nine will leave and there'll be one left. And I watched it happen night after night after night. One per Jesus goes after one. He leaves the 99 and goes after one. I want you to think right now. Who is it that God is speaking to your heart to reach? There's somebody. It could be a co-worker. It could be, I don't know. It could be your great grandma. I don't know. But it's going to come with valleys and burdens. And we have to learn how to avoid the valleys. We have to learn how to go around them. There's going to be even burdens that come against your vision to reach people. We are called to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Philip, do you remember years ago? The, I know you can recall. The, I was sitting and thinking about it last night. The vision I used to have to reach people. You couldn't. There was nothing going to stop me. But you know, that did not start automatic. Somebody had to plant the seed. Somebody had to come along. One person. I spent nine months of my life following Les around. Wherever Les went, I went. If he went to the jail, I was going. If he went to the nursing home, I was going. If he was going to pray, I was going. If he was going to have Bible study, I was going. If he was going to have Sunday night service, I was going. Wherever he was at, I was going. I was being discipled. And as I was being discipled, something was being planted inside of me. What got planted inside of me was to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ because I know what the world is looking for. They are looking for the love of God and if we're not here to tell them, who's going to tell them? Who's going to preach to them? The Bible says that we must preach the gospel to them. How will they hear except one preach to them? You know, I'm not looking for a street corner with a megaphone to go out here and start screaming and shouting at people. I got a vision for reaching on my job. Philip, are you a living testimony? I met Philip and I saw it. That's the first thing. When I walked into my job, I saw the call of God on him. Bang. I didn't even know what I saw. I just saw something. I walked right over to him and I said, God's got a call on you. He said, don't talk to me. That's a, a valley, a burden, a wall, and a mountain. So what? You know what you start doing? You start praying for that person. Then God puts, he, God moves on the boss, right, Philip? That's what happened. And said, Todd, a couple, I mean, this is several weeks later. Todd, you and Philip are working together every day from now on. You know, sometimes you can't do anything, but God can. God's bigger than that person. They can refuse you, run from you, but they can't run from God. God will get them in a corner. He will cause it. He will work all. He works all things together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. I was called to that purpose. When you get that vision, even if something is in the way of that vision, you turn to the place of prayer and you are praying and fasting and you are fasting and seeking God. God, I need you to remove this. If you called me to do this, then you are going to have to make it possible for this to happen. What happens from that day forward, Philip? We talk about the Bible every day, all day long. Eight and ten hours a day. This is what grabbed me. This is what I was gripped with a vision to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is impossible for a pastor. I'm telling you all this. It is impossible for a pastor to disciple. This is a small church and there's no way I can, I can disciple every person in here. If you, only what you are getting in here on Sunday, it is not enough. This is why you have to begin to form relationships. And those who are older and mature, those who are older and wiser in the Lord, I ain't talking about your age, I'm talking about if you've been in the Lord, if you've been following Christ 10, 20, 30 years, you have to reach out even to the younger ones within a congregation and begin to make disciples. We have, they don't happen, folks. Disciples do not happen. I did not know what it meant to pray until I was around somebody who prayed. If you're going to be a believer in Christ, why don't you go...
You have to. I, there is no other. You can't halfway follow Jesus. You can't walk with one foot following him and the other foot going down another path. Eventually you're going to be split and your heart is going to be split. You have to get both feet on the path and both eyes set on the course that is before you. You have to set your eyes on Jesus. And yes, he's going to bring you to places that you did not want to go. He does that. That happens. I'm sorry. He even told Peter, he said, one day they're going to take you where you don't want to go. He knows what you don't want to do. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I was a shy person. Now look at me. That's why I played drums because I could hide behind. I didn't have to talk, didn't have to sing in a band. Nobody expects a drummer to ever sing. Guitar, sing, right? Sometimes. They don't ever expect a drummer to sing. I'm the worst singer in the band. <laughs> Ain't that right, right? No, he hears me hollering back there. I just say, thank you, Lord. But you have to begin to see beyond the mountains, the valleys, and the walls. So where there's no vision, people perish, okay? I went through this statement last week. Write this down for yourself. Vision for the church is knowing what God wants and then forming ourselves around it. So we're just still in the, the, the stages of talking about this. We have not yet even begun to talk about what it is. We have to know this first. We have to know what God wants and then form ourselves around it. What do I mean by that? Well, when God begins to communicate to you, like I said a while ago, sometimes you go, sometimes you're sent. Sometimes we don't want to go. Sometimes we're too busy to go. We have to make time for it. We have to do that. Sometimes we are sent. Sometimes God tells you, hey, you see that guy over here on the other side of the gas pump? I've had this happen. I'm sitting there pumping gas. I'm thinking about, you know, whatever I'm thinking about. And I hear a still small voice say, hey, there's a, this guy on the other side of the gas pump. I want you to stop pumping your gas and just go around there and speak to him. I'm like, I don't know this dude. I, now, I got somewhere I got to be in a little bit, Lord. See, we don't want God to interrupt us. We want to say we're a Christian, but we, want, we don't want God to interrupt our life. We're going about doing what we're doing. Either you're following him or you're following your own ways. Oh, my. Am I going to step on all the church's toes, including my own? I'm giving him every excuse, but I'm being sent. If my heart's going to be obedient, I have to say, okay, God, I forsake what I'm doing, even though, and I can call somebody and tell them I'm going to be late. And I've got a legitimate excuse. Sometimes there's no excuse for being late. I have a legitimate excuse because I was doing you know, we, Philip and I, we go out every Sunday. We used to go out every Sunday morning preaching the gospel. And we told the pastor, we're going to be late to church, and this is why. If we are late, this is why. Well, we weren't usually late, but sometimes we were. Because we were preaching the gospel. Let me tell you, if you are late getting here for any other reason, you may not have a legitimate reason. I ain't saying that some things don't happen. Sometimes your car breaks down, whatever. If you're late getting here because you were preaching the gospel to somebody, I will give you $20, okay, out of my own pocket. I just threw it out there. I just swore to something that I, <laughs> if you come in and say, if I, if I ask you, why are you late? And you say, well, Todd, I, you better not lie to me for $20, all right? <laughs> you better not do it. You're going to be in trouble with the Lord. If you say, I was preaching to somebody, I was, I was that's a good reason. Glory to God. I done swore to something now, Pastor Liz. <laughs> All right. So my wife probably thinking, what's he out there talking about? All right. So let's look at this real quick, and then I'm going to close right here, okay? Isaiah 28. Let's flip over just a couple of chapters. We'll notice that Isaiah talks a lot about vision. Vision requires withdrawal from that which intoxicates. That's what I've highlighted here. As we look here, he says, But they have also erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink, and they are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Now listen, we could take this in a singular form and me sit up here and tell you, you don't need to be getting drunk. You don't need to be drinking. There, When I believe... And for what that snapshot of that society, okay? There's a whole lot of things that intoxicate us. They get us into a toxic position where we, have, we are spiritually toxic or we've been intoxicated. 
take that with just a, a singleness of mind here, but I do want you to know that vision requires you to withdraw from anything that intoxicates you. That can be a whole lot of things, you know. It may be what you read. It may be what you watch. I don't know. I bet if you went to the library and checked out Fifty Shades of Grey, you'd probably be surprised who all read that book. Now, if I stepped on your toes, I should have. That junk does not belong in the same vessel with this. You know, we hear a lot about pornography in our society, but there is just as much that is in the same vein going after the female mind. And it may not be through visual, but the Lord, the reading material is garbage and trash as well. So there's a warning to all of us, whichever side of the plate you own, male or female, you need to guard your heart and your mind. You know, ladies, don't criticize a man that he's been watching pornography if you've been reading smut. I'm just being honest, okay? Same way, both sides. So we have to know that it's, it's there for either one, okay? But it's just in different ways. So I want you to see that in whatever form, whatever it comes after you to distract you, to get you off from what God has put in your heart to be and to do, you have to put away things. That's called sanctification. You know, some things are personal convictions, some things are clearly defined in Scripture. He says right here that the priest and the prophet, that they've erred in their vision. You know why? Because them, they, they just got drunk. That will capture you. You know, I've tried to warn. I've tried to warn people. I've warned me, my children. Did you know, nobody, I don't know a single person that has ever said, they wake up one day and say, when I grow up, I want to be an alcoholic. Nobody says, when I grow up, I want to be a drug addict. Nobody. They have some other aspiration. But what is it that gets them off? They become intoxicated with the things that the world offers us in order to deal with what we are going through. When I woke up and realized that I was an alcoholic, it was a long, slow process that got me there, and I was deceived. Even though I grew up having an alcoholic father and said within my own heart, I will not repeat what he did. How much more of an example could be set before me to show me what that looks like, and then I become the same thing? It's amazing. Thank God for deliverance. So my vision determines, as he said, they erred in judgment. Vision will determine your decision making. When you have a vision, and that vision is when God has spoken to you, and that vision begins to control your life, literally, it affects your decision making. When the vision to win people to the lost has my heart, Nothing stopped me. I lived in Charlotte. That vision would wake me up on Saturday morning and say, you know what? I worked all week. I went to Bible college. So what? I'm going to the streets of Charlotte if I go alone. And I'd get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to, to go minister to the homeless people because I knew they would be on the street and no, nobody would be there to, but them. I went there with that specific pur purpose because I felt like God had put in my heart, I want you to preach to the homeless people. And I began to realize what lifestyle they're living in. And that people don't care. The society doesn't care about them. The police just kept them out of there during the week because the business people are coming in. They keep them out of there. They don't want them to be seen. But on the weekend, they come up in there. They're sleeping under newspapers and boxes everywhere in corners. They're trying to get somewhere where it's warm, whatever. They're digging through the trash cans. They're living under the bridges. Did you know right now I can walk you a block from this place and there are homeless people living a block from this church. Will somebody in this church get a vision to reach the homeless people? 
They're living right here in the woods, a block from here. I can walk you to where they are. These are people that are desperate. Broken people. We ought to have to look for broken people. They're in the jail. It's a fruitful ministry. People say, oh, that's just jailhouse religion. No, the, many of these people are at the bottom of life. There's no lower that they could go at that point. There are people out here that are broken. I ain't talking about everybody just out here trying to panhandle people and con people. I, I've done been panhandled, con. I mean, uh, listen, I walked the streets of Charlotte. I got panhandled every 10 minutes. You know what? I found out a lot of the people within the, even the homeless community, they were too ashamed to go to the, the soup kitchen. You know what I was doing? I was feeding them. Many times what I was doing, I would go get a backpack full of beanie weenies. Remember this, Philip? I remember taking Philip and I called him and I said, I want you to come to Charlotte, spend the night, and we're going to go out on the street ministering to people. And I remember Philip saying, what are we going to do? I said, you will watch. You will just fall into this. And he fell into it. He got to the point where we would go out and minister together. I wouldn't even say anything. I was following him around. How beautiful is a thing. I love that when that happens. I was watching God in action. Bang. We go from hesitation to, Lord, exasperation. We begin to exasperate ourselves for the gospel. Don't you want to expire yourself for the gospel? You know, I don't want to die of old age. I want to die because I've emptied myself. When Jesus died on the cross, he had emptied himself. Read your Bible. You have to empty yourself. Of what God has put inside of you. My last scripture here. Is Isaiah 29. And verse 11. And I will close. He says here. And the vision is. The vision of all is become unto you. As words of a book. That is sealed. Which men deliver to one. That is learned. Saying read this. I pray you. And he says I can't. For it's sealed. Sometimes we are a learned person. Sometimes we have become a disciple, but we come into a place where it's like what we once held as a vision is now sealed up from us. That seal has to be broken and has to be renewed to us. The vision has to be renewed to us. We have to remember the vision. You know, when he spoke to Habakkuk, he told Habakkuk in Habakkuk 3, he said, write the vision down that he that reads it may run with it. When the vision becomes something that is written down before us and written into our hearts, I need the mature people in this body to begin to assemble themselves for the work that we have been called. I need you to assemble yourself to begin to make disciples, not only of people out here, but those who are already with it. And listen, I'm speaking to you this because I want this to be renewed to you. If you have held the vision to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ, may it be renewed to you and refreshed to you right now in the name of Jesus. I want you to be stirred in your heart because this world is desperate for the gospel and we have, folks, we got to reach them. There are people that are, will die and go to hell if we don't speak the gospel to them. I don't want to stand in eternity and God place a crown on my head but then me see other people that went by that I could have reached I'll throw my crown down and say, dear Jesus, would not I have, would that I would only had another year, another day, another opportunity. Because there are people that are in hell right now who are saying, oh, if you would just send someone from the dead to speak to them. close we have to have a vision 
and hold it. Not let it slip. I've let my vision slip. And I'm warning you, don't let your vision slip. Don't become distracted. You have to come into an agreement with the vision that you hold and be held by that vision. God has put that vision. I know this, if you are a Christian and you are a believer, God has put in you the vision to reach other people. He has put in your heart the vision to reach other people. Now you have to do it. You can't just hear it. You have to do it. You've got to go and do this. You've got to do it this week. You have to do it. We are those who do it. Remember what Mary said to the servants? When they were at the wedding at Canaan of Galilee, she said, whatever Jesus says to you, do it. Just do it. That's what Nike, they put it on their box and we put it on our shirt. Just do it. Just go do it. Just go do it. Watch and see what will happen. You're going to start seeing miracles. Signs and wonders follow the preaching of the gospel. You know why we don't see signs and wonders? Because we don't preach the gospel. Father, I need my vision renewed. I need my vision renewed to reach. Just, Lord, if it's just one. Help me to reach just one. If each one in this room would reach one and begin to teach one, we want our world to change. We pray for it to change. Lord, I didn't preach this to put anybody under guilt or condemnation. I preach this because this is your command. You have commanded us to go into all the world and reach them with the gospel and to make disciples. I pray you stir this up in our heart as I close this today. As April is going to have a meeting with us about outreach, I pray that you are stirred to come into that. There's going to be discipleship. There's going to be, this is an opportunity of us. We're coming together, church. We're coming together to reach people with the gospel. Father, bless this time and our communication together. Lord, as we, we make a decision to go, I know that you go before us. You go before us and you prepare the way. Everything that you want us to do, God, I pray that you give us leading of the Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that there's going to be, Lord, things that happen that we have not even thought of. And I praise you for that. I praise you first and foremost for the salvation of men, women, and children and the saving of souls. That's what I praise you for. That we're going to see salvation. We're going to see people born again into the kingdom, even if it was but one, if all of us put all